Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. I uh, hope today finds you well and uh, excited, uh, if not just for the Super Bowl, the opportunity to uh, spend some time looking at evolution. So um, the big thing to keep in mind here is that evolution is the unifying idea uh, in biology. It helps explain the relationship between all organisms and uh, the various features that we study uh, throughout the year. So yeah, I'll tell you now, uh, on the AP exam, particularly in the writing portion, any opportunity you have to tie a specific concept uh, back to evolution uh, will certainly uh, impress the readers. So, you know, we see it everywhere, even in uh, dandelions and their evolution of uh, pigmentation that allows insects to see where the pollen is located. Aids the reproduction, helps the insects. So, uh, what we're going to focus on is uh, the big ideas related to how organisms evolve. Now, uh, an important component of all this is looking at um, sort of the historical context in which uh, the discovery of evolution was made. So uh, we want to look at, you know, what people were looking at or thinking about in the uh, 1800s. Now, one area that uh, sparked a lot of interest and questions uh, was what you see uh, in the earth and coming from the earth. People had found all these uh, fossils of organisms and uh, wondered about how you place this in the context of natural history. Now you have to remember that at the time, uh, the prevailing thought in uh, biology uh, is the uh, concept that the Earth was relatively young and that uh, species on Earth were uh, fixed and unchanging. Um, this perspective was uh, dictated by uh, interpretations of uh, the Bible at that time and that sort of uh, was the overriding feature of uh, naturalism. So uh, what people began to do though is look at um, what they found in nature, uh, particularly uh, these fossils, and what they found or uh, what they concluded was that you know it may be an indication of um, evidence of life at different points in Earth's history. So um, we look at all these ideas that led up to the breakthrough of Darwin and his sort of synthesis of uh, these different uh, concepts into his uh, explanation for evolution. So um, again, Darwin took all these ideas from other people and was able to pull them together, sort of in the same way that Watson and Crick were able to uh, use the work of, you know, Franklin and Chargaff and others to uh, have their breakthrough. All right, now, one um, influence on Darwin was the work of Thomas Malthus. Uh, what he did was look at human population growth. And the point he made is that, you know, given steady reproductive success, um, populations can explode in their number. So you would eventually uh, expect a point on an inflection curve where the population number would take off. Uh, but that in nature, this virtually never happens. Populations may grow exponentially for a period of time, but they're going to hit another inflection point in the curve where they enter this logistic growth or level off. Um, and you know that was the point Malthus was trying to make, and the question be, can become, you know, why is it that populations don't continue to grow exponentially? And uh, the obvious answer is, you know, these limits on resources. Not every organism is going to be successful. Not every organism is going to be able to uh, live and reproduce. And you see this uh, every year when uh, samaras or these little winged helicopter seeds get dropped from uh, maple trees. You know, tens of thousands of these seeds can be dropped, but almost none of them. Uh, will grow into uh, mature offspring. Again, uh, intense uh, competition for resources plays a big role uh, in that. So when I think of Malthus, I think of uh, my uh, Spanish classes back in high school and college with Moy Mall. He's Mr. Doom and Gloom. He focuses on you know, all the uh, factors that can limit population growth. So that was a one, again, significant influence on Darwin. Uh, another looked at this idea of uh, catastrophism. Uh, this was um, an early explanation for how all these different uh, fossil specimens uh, were created. Uh, Cuvier said that uh, there were points in history where there were these major uh, cataclysmic events that killed off uh, large numbers of organisms, so you'd see these extinct fossils, and what would happen is that new organisms would simply move in uh, and replace them. So, you know, that was his overarching uh, explanation for this fossil evidence that was found. Uh, but people started to ask questions about how are these extinct species related to uh, species that we see today. 
Uh, let's see, Lyle had uh, a very important um, concept that Darwin was able to draw on. Uh, it's this idea of uniformitarianism. So uh, again, Scrabble word, put that in your back pocket. Uh, let's see, now the idea is uh, these events that shaped the Earth uh, hundreds of millions and billions of years ago uh, still affect the Earth in the same way today. So, you know, from erosion to, um, you know, volcanic eruption, uh, all sorts of events that uh, shape the physical Earth um, shaped it long, long ago. So that went directly against the idea that the Earth was only, uh, you know, six or seven thousand years old, but was uh, potentially millions and billions of years old, uh, as we know now. So uh, this was significant because uh, Lyle's explanation for the Earth and how it's changed provides uh, the time and the uh, purpose for uh, evolution of species. So Lyle, again, a very significant influence and uh, a colleague of Darwin. All right, uh, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, uh, again, very important because he actually made the leap and said life does change, life has evolved. Uh, over time to adapt to this changing world. Now, again, he was uh, sort of unique in the idea that life does uh, evolve, and uh, he tried to explain this mechanism, mechanism of evolution. Um, he said it happens through the uh, means of acquired traits. Now, uh, doesn't work out, it doesn't, doesn't happen. Uh, his thought was that through use and disuse, organisms can change and shape their body and then pass on those changes to their offspring. Well, hogwash, right? Yeah, we know that certain phenotypic changes have no change that occurs in the gametes and won't get passed on. You know, if a person develops skin cancer, well, that mutation occurred in the cells of their uh, epidermis, and that's not going to be passed on to the somatic cells. Or if you have this, you know, big bodybuilder person, you know, lifts weights and get these huge muscles, I can have a baby with gigantic muscles. You know, changes that get passed on have to be passed on uh, through uh, the gametes. But, of course, they didn't know anything about genetics then. Um, at the time that Lamarck had uh, published his work, um, Mendel hadn't even done his peat plant studies yet. So, uh, it was important because he actually stood up to say, yes, life has changed. Uh, but again, his mechanism didn't quite pan out. And, uh, you know, again, Further evidence for the fact that acquired traits doesn't work is uh, through the descendants of bonsai trees. So you can, you know, sculpt a particular tree uh, and have it grow in particular directions and stay a certain size. Uh, but if allowed to grow, the offspring of this you know, manicured tree will go to grow to a regular size. So again, it's not a change in the gametes; it's only a somatic change. So uh, these were some of the major influences on Darwin um, as he sort of work to understand some of the uh, observations that he'd made in his journey around the world. Now, Jar uh, Darwin was a, a person who grew up loving nature, as evidenced by the um, ruffled collar and brass buttons and lovely potted plant that he's holding there. Uh, but yeah, the guy uh, loved nature, wanted to study nature, but uh, his family wanted him to become a doctor. So a prominent family wants him to you know, have a prominent position in society as well. But uh, he dropped out of med school and decided he wanted to enter the clergy because, uh, you know, with, as with the example of Mendel there, clergy uh, had chances to uh, study and teach uh, science. Uh, so he's getting ready to do this, but uh, his family worked to help him get a job as uh, the captain's companion on the HMS Beagle. Uh, the job of the Beagle was to uh, go and map parts of South America and uh, Darwin spent time uh, acting as a ship's naturalist, sort of making note of plant and animal species that he observed uh, on the five-year voyage. So this shows his uh, circumnavigation uh, of the world, um, you know, many notable stops, uh, but the most significant of which is certainly the Galapagos Islands. Now, the Galapagos are sort of fascinating because they're, uh, they're equatorial islands. They're very near. Uh, the equator and just west, maybe five or six hundred miles west of uh, Ecuador. So here you have uh, these islands in a tropical zone, uh, but the islands themselves are temperate. They'll have uh, wet and dry seasons. And uh, because they, it doesn't show it here, but they have three different ocean currents all uh, converging on this one location. So they have cold waters from the uh, Antarctic 
and uh, warmer waters from the uh, Pacific all mixing here. So it brings together all different forms of unique life seen uh, nowhere else on Earth. So it's pretty fascinating. You have this group of islands that are um, close to a you know, major continent. Uh, not that all continents aren't major, but uh, close to South America uh, and bringing in life from all these different places. So you wind up with, uh, again, all these animals that are very unique and what Darwin realized is in their own way well adapted to uh, their particular uh, locale. Uh, one such example is the uh, flightless cormorant. Uh, I, I love these birds. Now, they have these small vestigial wings that are completely useless for flight, uh, but as you can obviously see here, uh, the birds are able to uh, swim around and uh, catch fish uh, underwater. So you have these birds that look like something that would be capable of flying, but you know when they stretch their wings in the water, you see that they're all scraggly, uh, but they are uh, quite uh, adept swimmers. So that's neat. Uh, we also see um, you know, probably the most famous, or one of the most famous inhabitants of the islands, uh, the red and blue-footed boobies. Uh, again, birds that um, on their face look similar uh, to one another. They look like they're related species, but you know, significantly different feet and uh, different nesting patterns. Uh, the red-footed boobies will nest in trees and uh, the blue-footed boobies uh, nest uh, on the ground. So they occupy different niche space uh, in addition to having some different structural features. Uh, let's see, again, here you're at the equator, but you have these equatorial penguins. Um, you have organisms, again, brought in from all sorts of uh, locales. Uh, and living at the islands. Uh, and of course the marine iguanas, uh, another famous uh, group of, or another famous group of uh, animals uh, living. They are the only lizards in the world that swim and then eat the algae off the rocks. And what's really neat, if you look at these little structures here, you know, you have these organisms swimming around in salt water. They have to have a means of regulating the salt balance so they can actually psh, expel highly uh, concentrated salt water through their little nostrils there. And uh, we can take a quick peek there. Oh, we missed it. Bummer. Let me try that again. I apologize. Boom, there it was. All right. So, uh, again, imagine going here in the 1800s. There's no internet. You can't even watch Bonanza. So, no TV. You go to this place that has all these organisms from all over the place that are absolutely fascinating. Now, uh, a big tip off uh, to Darwin were these uh, tortoises that he found. Uh, what he learned uh, from speaking to people uh, that lived in the Galapagos is that different tortoises on different islands had different shells. And you could tell the island from which a, a tortoise uh, came by, simply by the shape of its shell. Uh, and what they had noticed, or Darwin had come to realize, is that the shape of the shells uh, is influenced by the type of vegetation uh, on the islands. Those organisms that have to reach a little higher uh, to get food tend to have m more domed uh, front portions of their shells. And of course those finches, these may be the most uh, well-known members of the uh, animal kingdom there in the Galapagos. Uh, Darwin had grouped all these different finches and early on thought they were all members of the same species, but uh, upon further investigation uh, after he got back to England, uh, decided that or recognized the fact that you have all these different uh, uh, finch uh, species that uh, occupied different islands or different places on the islands. And uh, what he came to realize is that these different species of finch uh, living in these different niches uh, likely uh, came from immigrant birds uh, that lived in South America. And uh, again, he used this as uh, one of his examples of natural selection uh, in his book. All right, we'll pause here and pick up on other material here in just a moment.